order. Oh my goodness. And I got our people in the studio. This is going to be great. The Landmark Conservancy will be uh, presenting Wild and Scenic Film Festival Saturday, April 15th from 3 to 6 p.m. at the Lacoudere Ojibwe University. And uh, there'll be a lineup of environmentally focused films plus remarks from our LCO's own Paul Domain will be there, and he's actually here in person to talk about what's going to be happening there. And, uh, well, good morning, sir. How you doing? Yeah. Well, it helps if I turn on your microphone. Let's see. That one, that one, that that would work. Well, I could hear real good. <laughs> anyway, so good morning, Mark. Good, and morning. good morning to WOJB's Wide World uh, Broadcast uh, Everywhere Online. Yeah. <laughs> wherever you might be uh -huh. beautiful so, day out here i wore my spring coat in right and it's winter it's uh, uh, seven degrees out and we've got a one foot uh storm coming at us here. i can't believe, believe this. this just keeps going on and on and on it's like please stop give us some help here so talk a bit about about this film festival and what's what films are going to be seen and what are some of the topics well, you're asking me a couple of questions I'm not aware of. I've actually oh. I, I've actually reviewed some of the small clips, but really um, I, I can't give you the name of them. What they are, are clips of some of the projects uh, that are uh, okay. being involved with with the different nature conservancies and tribes and so forth. And so um, I'm pretty sure one of them was about this uh, national park lands that were acquired by Red Cliff uh, recently turned into a park, returned to the tribe kind of a thing. Projects. Mm -hmm uh projects that exemplify uh the cooperative nature of what uh the conservancy is looking for in terms of building relationships uh with tribes and uh organizations that are interested in conserving land and significant cultural historical sites yeah and this whole thing is kind of trying to build tribal cooperative relationships for some land back efforts and that's where you come in right Oh, that's that's part of it. There's no doubt about it. I think there's been, uh, you know, ever since I've been involved in the tribal scene, mm -hmm. tribes have uh, slowly emerged with the ability to reacquire lands within the reservation and other uh, significant sites and everything. And so it's a real opportunity. There's actually people willing to donate their land back. Uh, there are major organizations who are willing to invest in land back. Uh, part of the USD, USDA a uh, lawsuit several, you know, maybe two decades ago against the USDA, which uh, obtained a settlement of of a billion dollars. And after all the money was paid out, went to establish intertribal agricultural council. And then even after that, there was money left over to put into an endowment. I believe the Indian Collective is now administering those monies, offering a very low or no interest loans uh, to individuals to help leverage uh, land back. And uh, our organization, Honor the Earth, uh, and uh, two organizations I belong to, Honor the Earth and Akin Eat Fire, which is more centered on Madeline Island, have both been recipients of individuals coming forward mm. and uh, either offering a good, uh, you know, land back uh, at no cost. We will, we're willing to title it. Uh, or at a decent cost or below market cost. In some cases, we've had to pay prime for some of the land, uh, but we're working uh, with nature conservancies and so forth to try to leverage uh, this idea. Uh, Honor the Earth has already acquired uh, several hundred acres of land in, in Minnesota under very, various land back uh, mm -hmm. donations. Some of them are campaigns, which uh, one of them recently raised $60,000 to help uh, put into the land back fund, uh, focusing on uh, actually a library, uh, Carnegie Library in uh, Park Rapids, which is a little bit out of the Nature Conservancy notion of things, but uh, it, it it was an asset that was available. Uh, our organization purchased it for a little over $200,000. Uh, two weeks ago, there was legislation in Minnesota introduced to help administer what's going to be a future museum for the 1855 treaty. Okay. So we're, you know, we're figuring out whether or not that property needs to be turned over so it can be administered in whole by some other organization or what it is. But I, I think uh, the conservancy here coming to Lacoudere uh, is working toward trying to expand that uh, tribal outreach. They would really like to uh, <clears throat> have some help, if, for example, in identifying particular properties that might be significant to tribes and see if there's a way to reacquire those and turn that back into tribal title 
or into title into some other entity like our organization. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. We're in the process of establishing what they call the Akeen Land Trust, which is going to operate similar as to the other conservancies. We want to be equal. A part of our approach, part of my individual approach, part of the reason I'm being invited to this is because we're doing these things for tribal people in an organizational level, yeah. on a tribal yeah. level. Mm -hmm. And there's some philosophy behind that. Part of it has to do with the fact that there are significant parcels off reservation that just don't gain the attention of the tribe because the tribes are dealing with so many internal things. For example, the uh, the burial grounds for the Battle of the uh, the Horsefly Battle or Hay Creek Battle up by Moose Lake. Uh, the individuals up there some years ago and expressed an interest in working with the tribe here or or. Bad River or Red Cliff, it's an Ojibwe burial ground. Right. Yep. Uh, in returns, uh, trying to define the properties and put it into some kind of conservancy trust, it gets automatically by the state of Wisconsin a tax exemption because of the burial ground cemetery status of that area. Uh, the tribe didn't respond to it at that time, has not responded to it. And I think th there have been times when other properties have been offered up. For example, another significant offering was the Barren county uh pipestone site the old quarry that was uh, famous throughout uh, from east of the mississippi mm -hmm. you have pipes in uh, connecticut and on the east coast that came from either the redstone quarry up here at la Couture or the barren uh quarry rice lake quarry that was historically used for uh, hundreds thousands of years um that's owned by a you know, a corporation that has an interest in land holdings for forestry. They're not doing anything with it. They know it's a historic site. They know it's a significant site. Is there any reason why a couple of acres of that area, which would include the old uh, village site up there where, where, where yeah. people worked it, mm -hmm. and the burial site uh, that's up uh, there at the quarry, uh, people didn't just go there for a few days. They went there and worked that area and were there for the summer kind of a thing and, and people uh, passed away and were, were buried up there. So we know that there's significant historical cultural significance to that. People have said sometime it needs to be given to the tribes or the Chippewa Federation or the Ojibwe Nation. And a lot of times there isn't anyone who steps forward to say, how do, how do, how does that get represented in a broad way? Yeah. Um, and so we want to look at uh, uses. We want to look at the idea that uh, the Ojibwe Nation territory was Ojibwe Nation territory, not Bad Rivers territory, not Bad right. Rays, not yeah. Fond du Lacs, joint use. There are significant maple syrup campsites that are available. And so we're trying to respond to that. And frankly, uh, Mark, it's <clears> where we're in an era that um, we're having a difficult time to, res to respond to all of the opportunities we have. Part of it, again, part of it goes back to tribal government philosophy and everything. You have elected officials that pop before, you know, they acquire a big chunk of land that's returned to the tribe. It's it's beautiful forested land. Tribe runs out of money. They cut the woods down. We've yeah. seen that happen, mm -hmm. unfortunately, in dire circumstances. And so our philosophy kind of is, is we need to create a trust that private organizations can deal with, perhaps deal with some of the opportunities off reservation easier, faster, but we would have tribal representatives on there. So we had yeah. good yeah. input from the tribes, but we also have some organizations have an outer interest. That is our organization, maybe even some non-tribal members on it so that the long time philosophy of what yeah. that land should be utilized is maintained. And there's some kind of a balance between all the interests. Yeah, yeah. So uh, joining us now is uh, Rick Remington of the he's conservation director and interim executive director of the Landmark Conservancy. Good morning, Rick. How are you? Good morning to you both. I'm doing great. Yeah. So uh, we had uh, Paul here just introducing some of the things that he was working on. Let's go back and talk about the film festival and what is involved in that and what type of films are going to be seen sure well um that's a great question you know the film the film festival uh has been going on in the area there for several years uh one of the organizations that landmark conservancy merged with several years ago was uh Couture waters regional land trust um this was a this was an event that uh, the land trust uh, had for several years after we merged we saw the value of it we saw the interest in it and we wanted to keep it going um, 
it's really an interesting event because, you know, there's, there's so many ways you can engage people with the land. You can get them out and walk on it and hike on it uh, to fish, to hunt, to do things of that nature. Uh, film is just another way to engage people, especially at a time of year that's a little bit interesting. The snow, at least down here in Menominee, is starting to wane. Um, I know up north you have a bit more, uh, but we're kind of in between seasons. <laughs> So yeah. at least, at least know days, I know this flat. weekend we're all going to get another, you know, five to ten maybe. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, but we're between seasons now. So film is a great way to just, you know, reinvigorate people and remind them of the importance of the outdoors and appreciating it and educating them about it. Get them inspired to move on to the next season. Mm -hmm. So um, the event is going to be April 15th, Saturday, April 15th, starting at 3 o'clock. Uh, will be a welcoming ceremony by Dennis White. And then uh, what films are going to be starting right after that? Oh, yeah. Great question. We've got a little something for everybody, I think. We've got uh, films on uh, bees, uh, coconuts and indigenous foodways, uh, hiking the Ice Age Trail. I think we're kicking off with uh, with a film. I've got my list here, The Last Ski Maker in Scotland. Um, you know, it's about, a, you know, along with a, with a break and some... Uh, closing remarks and things of that nature. It's a two to three hour event. Um, and I think the interesting thing is it's not just a film about animals or about land or about agriculture. You know, it's a scattershot. There's, um, there's films on climate change. There's films on the importance of, uh, of land and addressing things like climate change. Uh, there's some adventure and certainly some of the things I'm passionate about, just nature and ecology and appreciating, you know, all the elements of our natural world. Mm, okay. Very cool. And then we'll get back to Paul now. Um, you'll be talking about uh, some time of reconciliation and self-sufficiency as you've been describing. What, uh, what else will you be talking about, uh, especially with Madeline Island and some of the things you're doing there? Well, I think uh, Rick uh, described this great, broader philosophy about uh, what people uh, involved in, in, in conservancy projects are, and that is to try to uh, maintain uh, lands in their pristine condition. And uh, certainly our organization has uh, some philosophical views about self-sufficiency, uh, food sovereignty. Yeah. Uh, organization uh, grows corn, uh, beans and squash, and hemp. And uh, we uh, have an interest in, in, in trying to uh, acquire some properties that have forest products. Uh, we don't want to just set aside land to be looked at. We want to set aside land that's utilized in a functional way that maintains its pristineness, but also utilizes the resources. And so uh, you're, you're going to be the first to hear about this, but uh, our uh, Akinit fire on the island, as of last week, acquired 200 acres on the north end. That land abuts the 1854 uh, Treaty Fishing Camp and surrounds that bog that people go down there and look at and uh, and, and look at it in awe for its products. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been burned over for a hundred and some years mm -hmm. since uh, Chippewa people uh, left pretty much left the island. Uh, but it's an area that is got uh, blueberries and cranberries and, and the resources are phenomenal that all can be utilized in a sustainable way. And so we've worked uh, very diligently for a couple of years getting to know the landowner up on the north end up there uh, was significantly involved in establishing a lot of the Madeline Island Conservancy lands mm -hmm. and, and, and the lands we are acquiring are in that area that's been preserved by other by the Madeline Island uh, Conservancy. Uh, we also bought another 20 acres in the middle of the island that was closed uh, last month as well, uh, heavy and uh, black maple, uh, birch. Uh, and other resources, which we're already tapping. And so we have a land use philosophy uh, that says uh, uh, there are medicines, there's, there's food, there's forest products that can be utilized, and we want to access, access those uh, to make life for tribal members uh, a little bit better. And of course, uh, these, uh, these uh, opportunities, um, especially on the land holdings uh, with, uh, on the North End, we're working with the Nature Conservancy to see if there isn't some kind of a partnership to complete the purchase of that, okay. which would r literally open these up to uh, public access and trails as well. Yeah. And, uh, of course, Winona uh, Leduc, uh, head on of the earth, has talked a lot about uh, uh, 
utilizing horses. She already has a horse herd. Uh, we, we, we use wagons and we use a lot of old uh, equipment to do a lot of the harvesting on the farms we have in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. We've been fire. Uh, we've been, uh, we, we just picked up 80 acres that was belonged by Moffat, a potato farm uh, corporation uh, right across from the Pine Point School uh, because they were spraying pesticides on their oh. potatoes. And so we acquired the land simply to take that out of that cycle and put it to use in farmlands. Um, And there's so many other opportunities. I mean, one of the things our organization is looking at to rise up in terms of awareness is those Pinocchio allotments as well. Uh, 222,000 acres, uh, 266 allotments issued either under the 1830 Santee Sioux Treaty or the 1854 Clause 7 section of the treaty makes up that mining claim in the Pinocchio's. And I think it was the Wisconsin Nature Conservancy that was on the verge of having that turned into parklands when the other co-owner of the other half of the mineral claims up there objected to it and brought it to halt. Of course, we know now the history of that. They had a bid by Klein, uh, Chris Klein and a GTAC Mining Company that uh, paid uh, Russell Gordy a lot of money to speculate on that. And that was another failed attempt to uh, mine that area. We're very interested in seeing if there can't be some momentum built uh, amongst all the nature conservancies because it's no. a big chunk of land. At one mm. point, there was legislation at the federal level, Proxmire, Obi, and these people were involved in acquiring the monies that would have paid for that. And so we want to get back to that now that GTAX out of the uh, Pinocchio Range. It's another project that could be jointly worked with individual tribes because we both have Santee Sioux, we have Bad River members, Lacoudary members that were uh, heirs to those allotments. Um, and it could be uh, utilized with independent organizations like us or even the land bank. Sure. If there's interest. So the yeah. dialogue, dialogue is necessary to build these partnerships. Yeah, yeah. Rick, what do you uh, are hoping that the Landmark Conservancy can do or uh, in their participation of this? What's your goals? Oh, boy. Um, I think multifold. Um, you know, if I could just step back, I guess, you know, Landmark has been around for um, about 35 years doing doing land protection work throughout Northwest Wisconsin, um, you know, under Landmark's name and also some of our uh, previous organizations, which had different names prior to our merger several years ago. Um, so land protection is something we think we're good at in doing this in the 35 years of our history. But as you both know, 35 years is the blink of an eye. So, you know, the opportunity to uh, use our skill set in working with local communities and citizens and other nonprofits, and to also extend that into working with the tribes, uh, the original stewards of the land, so to speak, uh, is critical to our work. Um, you know, as Paul is alluding to, land is, you know, complicated. Uh, it's emotional. Nothing can invoke more uh, passion and anger and happiness uh, than land. And, and so if we can figure out ways to dialogue, to work together, to figure out areas where there's partnerships um, or potential partnerships, we would all be well served. Um, you know, we obviously can accomplish more together than we can alone. And I feel like I, I learn that more every single year I'm involved in this work. Um, we can't do our work in a silo. You know, we can do our individual tasks in a silo, but we need to get out and talk about our work and talk about the need of others and how we can serve one another. And I think this, um, you know, this partnership and bringing this uh, Wild and Scenic Film Festival um, to your neighborhood is just an opportunity to amplify our work, to talk about our work, to get people interested in land protection to get them educated about issues that are, you know, local and affect our local land base and our local resources, but also, uh, you know, invoke interest and passion about environmental issues on places on our planet that most of us will never see, um, but that other groups are doing that we can learn from and try to bring those messages home to our own neighborhood. Um, I I could go on and on. I mean, this is a, this is such a fun conversation. Yeah, Rick, Rick, I'm just wondering, uh, can you give us a couple examples of uh, some of the projects you worked on in the area here? Sure. Yeah. Um, Not too far north of here. I think I'm going to call it one of our flagship nature preserves is uh, Tyler Forks Community Forest. Uh, It's 594 acres um, adjacent to Copper Falls State Park. 
Uh, we've got hiking trails there. Obviously, we've got Tyler Forks, uh, the river, uh, opportunities to fish and ski and hunt and appreciate the land base. Um, you know, not only has Landmark invested in um, land protection, which is sort of our, you know, our primary mission, but we realized very quickly that you can't do this work, you know, in a silo. And we've invested now in communication and community engagement staff who can get people out on the land. Um, other areas in your neighborhood that we've protected would be um, up, a lot of work up in the, in the greater Bayfield area, uh, North Pikes Creek, the Lincoln Community Forest. Uh, we've got, you know, projects with private landowners called conservation easements. Uh, and these are places where land is set aside in its natural state, but continue to be owned uh, privately. Um, any opportunity we get, we'll work with other communities, you know, very close to home in your neighborhood is the, uh, the Grindstone Lake uh, Cranberry Bog. Um, the Grindstone Lake Foundation acquired this um, a couple of years ago, and um, I'd like to think that we played a, you know, a strong role in working with that group in helping to uh, counsel them, helping to raise dollars to purchase that important property, which is critical to the health of Grindstone Lake. Um, <clears throat> You know, and throughout our 20 counties, we've got uh, about, oh, I want to say about 2,500 acres. Uh, that's open to the public, you know, for hiking, for hunting, for fishing, for trapping. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I so could go on. Yeah, so it, it brings to mind two things. Number one, you, you mentioned the Tyler Forks. And, of course, the mm -hmm. Tyler Forks uh, runs. Wonderful story about uh, an, an indigenous uh, Anishinaabe Quay woman a name Wabagi, who was found petrified in there and a long story about how she was lost. And of course, the Tyler Forks runs through the Pinocchies uh, uh, at, uh, you know, through Upson Falls and, and uh, runs along the old Ironton Trail, an old village site at Upson, Wisconsin. And that trail runs through the Pinocchies up there. And so I'm, I'm very familiar with the Tyler Forks and its history. And so happy to hear that you were involved with uh, a couple of those projects up there. And I you know, uh, I think the Carolina Lake, the head of the Bad River, uh, Bad River starts up there, was recently put into conservancy. There's been a huge turnover, which is an interesting because there's been a whole a huge turnover. For example, on Madeline Island, the ferry line is being sold because of all the original investors that are in their 80s and 90s. And mm -hmm. there's a huge turnover of business opportunities. But there's also the situation where you have people. Uh, come forward and saying, "Look, at uh, you know, we're 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 aging, and uh, we don't have any children, or our children are well off, and we've got a chunk of land somewhere, and we'd like to do something with it. We'd like to respect the history and culture of the indigenous people who are here. Yeah. How do we do that? And so we're at a time when there's not only a turnover of business activity in this level of people who uh, invested in northern Wisconsin 50, 60, 70 years ago." are ready to do something with their lands and literally will come forward. And, and we've had a couple of people come forward, which is why we're trying to establish our own trust and say, uh, we'd like to title this 40 acres to you if you'll take it. Mm -hmm. You got to you gotta know how to take it because you do have obligations for taxes and other things. You got to do something yeah. with it. So you need to know how to encumber and work with it. So the land trust model that we've looked at in some of these other conservancies certainly seems to be one path to follow. Yeah. Your comments, Rick? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll echo that. You know, I have the opportunity in the course of, uh, of my work, as do my coworkers, to talk to those individuals. You know, um, none of us are getting any younger, sorry to say. And so you've got, uh, you know, the baby boomers, that generation and their wealth, which includes, you know, land and other assets, is something they have to deal with. And uh, sometimes land can be a problem for people. They, they have an interest in protecting it, uh, aren't sure how, may have um, kids who aren't interested in stewarding it the way they have. Maybe they have no kids or heirs at all. And we wind up sort of playing, um, you know, counselor or, you know, a shoulder to lean on to talk about potential outlets for that land. You know, I'll be the first to say that, uh, you know, an individual's, um, not everybody is in a position to give their land away some people are, and there are certainly options uh, like the tribe, like Landmark Conservancy, other nonprofits that are in a position to help make that happen. Um, and sometimes there's other individuals that have that land and have other you know, causes and issues that they want to support too. But, you know, um, sometimes we often serve as kind of a clearinghouse to help them figure out um, 
options for that land, whether to keep it in the family, whether to sell it, whether we can be involved in it, whether we can pass that relationship on to another conservation partner, which could be a, a local unit of government, which could be a tribal entity. Um, but to try to figure out, you know, solutions for land problems, I guess, would be a good way to sum it up. Mm, sure. So show up. Yeah. If you have land you want to give away, <laughs> if you know of land that uh, contains mm -hmm. a significant cultural, historical uh, importance to indigenous people and want to talk to us, uh, come to the Wild and Scenic Film uh, Festival and there'll be wild and scenic people like me there presenting on April 15th from 3 until 6. I don't know about 6. scenic, but you're wild, that's <laughs> for sure. Definitely, and I think it's an opportunity too to... Um, you know, I, I love my time alone outdoors in the woods with my own thoughts. But I think, you know, getting in a room full of people who care about and are interested in the same things that we're interested in is refreshing. It's invigorating. Uh, you'll have conversations that you may not have an opportunity to have elsewhere with, you know, land conservation and the environment being the, the focal point of those conversations. So it's very invigorating. All right. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. That's all we have for now. But uh, again, mark, mark the date down, April 15th from 3 to 6 p.m. Tickets are available at the landmarkwi.org site. Just go to landmarkwi.org for tickets and more information. This will be held at the Lakutare Ojibwe University at the James Pipe Mustache Auditorium. Uh, Rick, Paul, thank you for showing up today. Appreciate it. Thank you both. All right. You are listening to WOJB 